So hello, my, my name is Michael Unzer. I'm from the Biomedical Imaging Group in EPFL Lausanne. I'm very happy to be here to give you this uh, presentation. So first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, Gert Leutz and also uh, Mario Figueredo for, for the kind invitation. I should also mention that this is a joint work by uh, some PhD students of mine. So uh, Pakshal, Joachim, Arshit, and Shayan. <clears throat> and so the title of the presentation is Deep Splines, okay? Uh, so maybe let me first give you uh, the sort of context and also may maybe the inspiration for, for, for this work, which goes back to the variation formulation of inverse problems in imaging, which has been a very hot topic, uh, namely in compressed sensing during the, the past decade. And, and so here you have a, uh, uh, so, so, so the problem here is to reconstruct an image. Uh, for example, here, a, a, a micrograph that where, where you have like uh, obtained uh, images that are blurred that were obtained with a microscope. And what you'd like to recover here is the <clears throat> unblurred uh, concentration here of a fluorophore. And uh, so here you have a, a, a linear model that represents the effect of uh, the microscope uh, after discretization. Of course, you have some additive noise that is being added. And, and so here the problem in, in computational imaging is really to recover uh, S, so, so the uh, set, set the original concentration of the fluorophore given those uh, noisy measurements. <clears throat> and so the way this is done in practice, uh, <clears throat> we were often uh, posing this problem or setting up this problem as a minimization problem. And uh, uh, so th there you have a cost functional that uh, consists of two terms. So there's a first term here that uh, kind of pulls your solution so that, that it's consistent with the measurement. That is, if you were re-simulating the micro microscope on, on the reconstructed image, you get something that's close to the measurements. But then you're also counterbalancing this by some regularization constraints. So you would like some energy of your signal to be low. And, and this L, for example, being a gradient. And uh, I, I guess here the preferred norms are uh, the two norms, uh, let's say, for the classical linear reconstruction algorithm and the one norm for uh, uh, compressed sensing. OK, so this is kind of uh, you know, like traditional approach to imaging. But what, what does that have to do uh, with splines and, and learning? <clears throat> and, and so it turns out that uh, the problem of supervised learning, you can also reframe as, as an inverse problem, a linear inverse problem, but there's a twist here. It is that you'll have, you'll end up with an infinite dimensional problem. And so here uh, in the learning case, and here we'll just look at the, learning of a scalar quantity here. Uh, so, so you have a bunch of, of data points. So, so let's say patterns that you may want to classify. <clears throat> and uh, so what you like to find here is a function that will map here this given x that you're observing into some output. And you would like this output to be y. And, and so you, you want to design here a mapping that goes from Rn to uh, R here such that I mean, this function that you want to design such that if you plug in the XM, you get, you get the desired YM. <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, this being uh, the F here being an infinite dimensional entity, so it's completely ill-posed. And, and so the thing one has to do is to regularize. And so it's very similar to, to the inverse problem formulation for imaging here. So one introduces, an operator that will act on F, for example, a, a gradient or, or a Laplacian operator. And, and so you will here uh, sort of measure the goodness of a, a certain F here by this energy here. And then what you want to do here, you want to try to satisfy your constraints so that F of XM should be more or less equal to YM up to some uh, here uh, uncertainty. And, and, and so given that constraint here, you want to minimize this energy here. And, and so in some sense, you're getting the, the minimum energy solution. And this you can also reframe using 
Lagrange multipliers, uh, you can reframe it as a uh, sort of very similar to what I, I was just presenting in the first slide. So you, here you have a data term and a regularization. Now what changes here is that the F here is no more discrete, but it, it is a function. And now if this regularization, you can associate it with the uh, norm in, in, in a squared norm in the Hilbert space, then it can actually be proven <clears throat> that the solution here will live in uh, a span of uh, some shifted kernels. And, and so the kernels will be shifted, uh, positioned onto the data points and, and the kernel here will be determined by, by the operator. And, and so this is uh, very powerful. And I must say, this is the foundation of classical learning and also in some sense splines. Uh, and, 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 so, and so there's a very good, uh, very well-developed theory in, in, in that area. <clears throat> but uh, this is, I, I would say, uh, classical learning. So, uh, uh, and, and so let's say support vector machine, uh, 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 regression, uh, ridge regression, et cetera. All, all those methods are, are based on, on kernels. Okay, so that's the classical view, but what has happened, as you all know, in, the, in <clears throat> machine learning, there's been a, a, the a deep learning revolution. And, and so the emergence of these deep neural networks. And, and so this came about uh, some years ago, let's say uh, 2012. Uh, so there was this image net competition where uh, classical machine learning uh, methods were competing for, for, for trying to classify a very, very large set of images. And then suddenly came some deep neural networks and they started uh, overperforming all the classical approach, uh, reaching almost uh, uh, human performance <clears throat> in, in, in uh, uh, 2015. And so what made that possible is, first of all, you had huge amount of examples to, to, <clears throat> to train uh, your neural network. And, and the other thing was you had also the resources to uh, develop very deep architectures. And, and, and so this is sort of a very, the state of the art now, now, nowadays, you, using machine learning for doing classification, but not only classification. So what I'd like to tell you about is a biomedical image reconstruction. <clears throat> and so there the idea was also to, to deploy uh, uh, deep neural networks to, to do biomedical image reconstruction. And so here's a, a photo of my former postdoc, uh, 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 Kyung, just got a faculty position in, in Korea. And, and so he, he joined my group, uh, you know, about uh, four years ago. And, and so he was trying to convince me that we, we should use neural networks to, to do image reconstruction. And I'm, I'm more like a kind of variational guy, but I'm still open-minded. So I, I let him uh, develop the, the algorithms to, to do image reconstruction. And so his idea was in, in fact, trying to do compressed sensing uh, using uh, deep uh, neural networks for, for the image reconstruction. And so his idea here was uh, in, in fact to, to do a, a pre-reconstruction using a kind of classical algorithm, uh, so filtered back projection and uh, with, with a very uh, few views so in a compressed sensing mode and then train uh, this uh, sort of uh, not so good reconstruction, uh, uh, no, train the algorithm to take this not so good reconstruction and to map them back on, onto very good reconstruction where you would have much more views. And, and so he was uh, proposed to use a, a unit architecture like that, uh, that had very good performance for classification uh, and, 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 so, uh, and also for some uh, denoising problems in imaging. And, and so he did that and uh, obtained some really ast astonishing uh, results. Must say he was not the only one. There were other groups doing that uh, simultaneously, but this was <clears throat> among the first work of using deep neural network for image reconstruction. And let me now show you some examples. So here is like uh, the, the, what we consider the ground truth. Uh, so that is a CT re a 3D reconstruction using uh, uh, many views. So it's uh, data provided by, by the uh, Mayo Clinic. 
And, and, and so uh, here we, we do uh, 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 those reduction by, by seven. So, so we, we're just uh, throwing away uh, quite a, uh, a large part of, of, of the acquired data and, and, and then reconstructing using a classical uh, filtered back projection uh, linear reconstruction. And that's what you get, a sort of signal to noise ratio of uh, 24 dBs. And then if you, with the same uh, data now, you use all this uh, compressed sensing uh, methods, uh, total variation regularization, you are able now to uh, get this kind of reconstruction. I must say here, so you, you have like an improvement in that case of, of about five dBs. And, and so this is also the kind of uh, research that, uh, for example, Ma Mario Figueredo, so one of our chairs here, has been very much involved. And, and so there have been about 10 years of compressed sensing, essentially gaining us <clears throat> of the order of 5 dBs. And then comes Kyong with, with the deep neural network. So what, what does the deep neural network da, do, do? It takes this image here. And uh, I mean, not this particular image here, but uh, equivalent images, uh, poor reconstructions, and, and tries to train a neural network so to compensate to, to regress, uh, go from here to here. Okay, so take those not so good reconstruction and try to get those better reconstruction. And so here's the output of, of the trained neural network. On, uh, it was trained on other data. So that's the testing data here. And, and so you, you get uh, much uh, better reconstruction. And here an improvement, <clears throat> almost five dBs, just the first uh, application of, of this deep neural network, which was, um, I must say, quite uh, substantial. <clears throat> and uh, in fact, this uh, paper had quite some success and uh, we were actually very pleased uh, last year to, to obtain the best paper award. In fact, it's not only the paper, it's not only the idea of using neural network uh, uh, for reconstruction, it's also, there's a theorem that uh, sort of gives an argumentation why we should use convolution neural network and uh, in, that goes kind of with the physics <clears throat> of, of uh, computer tomography. Anyway, uh, this approach uh, works also uh, well, uh, even better if, if you do, uh, you know, like more extreme imaging, like uh, with a reduction of a, of a factor 20. And, and then here, if you do your filtered back projection, you get all these streaking artifacts, very characteristics of, of uh, reconstruction for uh, low views. And if you use the total variation, uh, so you, you get better reconstruction, but of course what you get is this kind of much uh, piecewise smooth appearance, which is very characteristic of, of uh, L1 regularization. And if you use the neural network, here you get uh, better quality <clears throat> and uh, still like an improvement also of, of the order of let's say four, four dBs. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so, so that's just spawned a, a whole area of research. And now uh, if you go, for example, at ISB at a <clears throat> biomedical imaging conference, you have zillions of papers on using neural networks to do all kinds of imaging, in particular uh, biomedical image reconstruction. And so it's a little like a parallel with compressed sensing where people have started using compressed sensing in, in every modality. Now people are, are just using neural network in virtually every modality. And, and so the first people to do those, uh, of course, got papers published. Uh, so, so that's our paper here in 2017. Uh, uh, also the uh, Wang's group uh, did that work, uh, uh, similar, very similar work at about the same time. <clears throat> there was also uh, similar methods uh, developed for magnetic resonance imaging, in particular Pock, uh, Thomas Pock, uh, which is one, one of the precursors here, uh, also a team here at uh, ETH, <clears throat> uh, dynamic MRI, so you, you can also do that not only in space but in time, and, 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 and so you, for example, uh, David Ruckert's group, uh, uh, Simon Arridge. So what's interesting here, all, all those guys are also like people, uh, the, the senior authors are people who are pretty well established in conventional 
compressed sensing type reconstruction, and they have now switched to uh, deep neural network reconstruction. <clears throat> a microscopy, so uh, OSCAN's group uh, got paper in Optica, which is like the, the top journal in, <clears throat> in, in uh, optics. Uh, also, uh, this happened as well in, in, in uh, microscopy, so some uh, nature paper by Jean Meyer's uh, group, 2018, uh, super resolution uh, microscopy, again, uh, optica, diffraction tomography, optics express, etc., ultrasound. So I think by now we, we have had this explosion, like <clears throat> everyone is, has been applying this to a, a very uh, wide range of, of imaging problems. Okay, so that's what sort of my in, uh, introduction. Why, for, for example, myself, I, I became interested <clears throat> in deep neural networks. But uh, for all those who know me, you know that, in fact, <clears throat> I'm maybe even more interested in splines. And, 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 and so here, what I'm trying to do here uh, has been to link uh, deep neural networks to splines in order to get a, a better understanding at, at, at what's going on. And so that's what I'm going to discuss for, for the rest of the talk. <clears throat> so now maybe just to set the notation, uh, here we have a feedforward deep neural network. And, and so what, what, what is a neural network? You all know that it's a bunch <clears throat> uh, of, of neurons like or organized in layers. And so the layers I, I will index by a little l. And uh, so, so for every layer, we'll have a certain number of neurons. And so the neuron I, I will uh, indexed by n. And so here we have uh, the nth neurons at, at the s layer. <clears throat> and, and, and so then what we're doing, we're like connecting those neurons and, and so connecting them uh, by <clears throat> applying uh, linear weights. But we also have a nonlinearity at, at the level of the neuron that we call activation function. <clears throat> and then what does the deep neural network do? It does first, uh, here applies linear weights and, 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 and also put, puts a bias here. So, so that's an affine transformation to go from one layer to the next. And <clears throat> after that, at the level of the neuron, it will just apply uh, a nonlinearity, pointwise nonlinearity. So that's as described here. <clears throat> and now if you uh, look at the structure here of a deep neural network, so what you have then is just the uh, combination <clears throat> uh, of uh, let's say linear, pointwise nonlinear, linear, pointwise nonlinear, etc. Uh, uh, and, and so it's deep when you have many uh, many layers like that. And and what is learned here in principle is just learning here the linear weights. Uh, so so it's the weights to put <clears throat> that are symbolized by 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 those arrows here. <clears throat> okay, so now it turns out that there is a very interesting, I would say, a deep relation between neural networks and splines, especially if you consider this particular nonlinearity. So that's called the ReLU nonlinearity. So it, it is like that. And I should say this is a, a simplest example of a linear spline. You see it's piecewise linear with a single knot. And now, uh, you know, during the years, so uh, ReLU has really appeared as a preferred choice of uh, <clears throat> activation function. So that was uh, first proposed in uh, 2011. But now uh, here, uh, the, the very famous people, Le Quin, Benjo Hinton, in their sort of foundational uh, nature paper, 2015, where they really like <clears throat> described this whole deep neural network uh, story. They really also emphasize that uh, use of ReLU makes the uh, training uh, <clears throat> of neurons, uh, deep neural network much more efficient and it gives us state-of-the-art performance. Now it turns out <clears throat> that if you have a ReLU nonlinearity, so it's a, let's say spline nonlinearity, so this will actually, just from the architecture of the neural network, and that's what I, I'm going to develop, will generate a, a, an input-output mapping that can be very high dimensional, but that is con continuous piecewise linear. So in some sense, a spline. So that's described, in, for example, in this paper here, 2014. And there's a very nice paper by uh, Gil Strang in Simon News also <clears throat> makes the connection between deep neural network and the fact that this will uh, construct something that is continuous piecewise linear. And also like Poggio, Rosasco, the MIT have also like 
early on recognize that, I mean, this has the structure of splines and we could really look at deep neural network as a hierarchical spline. So let me make this a little more explicit. So let's start with a, a 1D, okay? So, uh, and here what we want to, to really define is this concept of continuous piecewise linear function. <clears throat> and, and so it's really indicated here. And this continuous piecewise linear function, uh, we spline people, we call that a non-uniform spline of degree one. And, and so, you know, how do you construct such a function? So, <clears throat> so first what you need here is a partition of the, let's say the X axis here. And so you'll partition this by uh, putting dots at the tau case. And, and now you have all those segments here and now, okay, you want to partition R in now a union of disjoint by, uh, segments, okay? <clears throat> uh, and you want to cover, of course, the whole real line. So what, what is a spline then? <clears throat> this was a <clears throat> linear spline. So it's a function that goes from R to R that has two properties. So first of all, in every one of those intervals, it should be linear. And, and so here's the, ex, uh, uh, the equation of a straight line. So with, with a slope here and an intercept, <clears throat> but uh, that's the easy part. So you want the thing to be linear in every interval, but the less trivial part is you want the pieces to be joined in such a way as, as to preserve uh, continuity. <clears throat> uh, okay. And, 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 uh, uh, and that's the second, uh, sec second condition here. <clears throat> and uh, okay, so that I would be, uh, that that's would be, uh, let's say the, this description of a spline, but spline people actually don't represent uh, 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 those splines in, in this way. They prefer to represent it in this way <clears throat> using some other coefficients. So there's a, a linear term here, which is a, is a global uh, uh, straight line. And, and then here is a sum here of, uh, what's called uh, one-sided power functions. But uh, for, for those who know ReLU, this is just a, a linear combination of ReLUs. Okay, so by, by just making here a, a linear combination of ReLUs, because the ReLUs themselves are uh, continuous piecewise linear. So you will automatically uh, generate <coughs> a, a linear spline. <coughs> okay, so that's the story in, in, in 1D. Uh, let's go to multiple dimensions and you can do a, a exactly the same. But now uh, you, instead of par partitioning the domain in segments, now you have to uh, partition the domain in, in uh, con convex polytopes. So for, for example, here in 2D, there are triangles. <clears throat> and, and so you get a partition as before. Now it's Rn in higher dimension <clears throat> such that I, I mean, the, the, the union is the whole domain and, and actually that <coughs> the, 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 those guys are, are non-overlapping. <coughs> okay, so then it's essentially the, the same story as before. So your, your function, now it's a function that goes from Rn to R. It's a continuous piecewise linear with this partition. So what does it mean? So within every PK, so it's every sort of polytope domain here, you want the function to be linear. So that's now a equation of a plane here. And, and again, that's the easy part. <clears throat> and the harder part is <clears throat> now to enforce that the, the function is globally continuous. So the pieces then are just stuck together. It's like a facets, but that are put together in a way that maintains continuity. Okay, so that's continuous piecewise linear in, in higher dimension. <clears throat> and uh, now what, what happens if you're not going from Rn to R, but to Rm? And, and so here you just have a bunch of component function. <clears throat> Every one of the component functions of that type is continuous piecewise linear. That will give you also something that is globally continuous piecewise linear. <clears throat> okay, so why, why, what is really beautiful with this continuous piecewise linear function is uh, for the first property uh, is, is kind of straightforward. So if you do a linear combination of those, uh, you maintain the property. But uh, what, what is 
I mean, really amazing is that now if you do the composition, and the composition is like in the neural network, it's like chaining the layers. Now, if you compose any two uh, <coughs> continuous piecewise linear functions, but with compatible domain, so that you have the right dimensions, actually what you generate automatically is also something that's continuous piecewise linear. So that means this continuous piecewise linear is really uh, maintained by, by chaining. Uh, the proof is actually <clears throat> relatively elegant in, in the sense that uh, the, the property uh, continuity, this is known by everyone that if you compose uh, two continuous function, you maintain continuity. Is also if you are if you are affine and you compose uh, two affine functions, you you maintain affine. But now if you combine the two properties, <clears throat> this is also maintained through composition. Now the the other nice thing is is that if you take for example the maximum, and so the maximum is often used for pooling neural networks. So if you have the max of two continuous piecewise linear, it's still continuous piecewise linear, same as with the min. And so what, what's the implication? Actually, the implication is that uh, deep neural networks, now which result here from the composition of linear pointwise, but now I think you all will agree, I already said it, that the ReLU is continuous piecewise linear. So this pointwise uh, function here is continuous piecewise linear. Affine is trivially continuous piecewise linear. So <clears throat> if you compose, uh, for, for example, like one layer, will be continuous piecewise linear. And then if you compose more layers, uh, you will be continuous piecewise linear simply because of this algebra property. And uh, this holds true uh, as well if you have max pooling uh, for dimensional reduction, or if now your nonlinearities would be more complicated than ReLU, but still like continuous piecewise linear function. So <clears throat> I, I guess at this, end, uh, at this point, I'm, I'm very happy because now I, I, I really like hit splines uh, because this just tells me that any uh, ReLU net neural network is actually a spline, okay? So but it's uh, maybe just another interpretation. <clears throat> but now let's look at something else. Okay, now what we want to do is maybe refine neural networks. And so uh, use uh, free form activation functions. And, and so it's more or less the same structure as before, but now we, we're, what we want to do, why, why use ReLUs? So why not be a little more daring and allow every neuron to learn itself, the, the activation function. And so that's those guys here that are represented in red, sigma and L. So every neuron is allowed to learn himself. And then we still have <clears throat> the same structure, okay? And, and now the new thing is, okay, we know how to train the linear weights, but now we want to do joint training to also uh, uh, train the activation. And, and of course, this is much more challenging because it's completely ill posed. So therefore we need to constrain activation function. So we need to use a regularization function, uh, you know, like uh, <clears throat> in classical learning or inverse problems. So, we should not penalize simple solution like identity, linear scaling. We should be differentiable so that we can uh, do uh, back propagation. And we like those continuous piecewise linear. So somehow we want to favor uh, functions with sparse second derivatives. And I mean, this suggests using a, a special regularization that I call total variation two. In some sense, this is a little like the dual of the infinite norm, but it's a little more sophisticated <clears throat> because uh, 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 here it's, it's de defined like a, like, like a supremum uh, over the, you know, with inner products with test function in Schwarz class, and those functions are infinitely differentiable. Okay, and, and, and this gives us now a, a space, I call native space over which we are going to optimize, so it's all the functions that have uh, <clears throat> here a finite total, a second total variation. So, so why is this nice? Because for example, if you just have the ReLU, you can compute this quantity and you get exactly one. Okay, and, and so here's the representer theorem for deep neural network. And so what, what does it say? Okay, so we are trying uh, now to optimize this structure. So it's more or less the same as before, we have linear layers, we have now the red ones, which are uh, uh, 
you know, uh, those freeform activations. And, and so we use the usual cost function. So it's a data term, maybe something uh, <clears throat> on the linear weights like a weight decay. But now we are adding something for every neuron that we're going to learn where we want to penalize the second total variation. <clears throat> okay. And, and so we want this way to, to uh, solve that problem. And, and so now here's the theorem, what it says. It says that if this problem has a solution, so if this can be minimized, it tells that, that oh, <clears throat> now the solution, so every neural activation should be a non-uniform spline, <clears throat> which in some sense is fantastic, okay? So you, you put like this variation constraint and, and the math tell you that the outcome here will, will be a, <clears throat> a linear spline. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let me be uh, a little more specific. So the outcome says that every neuron should have this form here. And if you remember from my spline slide, this is the generic equation of a linear spline with some adaptive knots at the tau's. Here some weights in the linear part here. But now each neuron has a number of knots uh, that is not known a priori, but has a certain number of knots uh, with some locations and some expansion coefficients to put in front. But now, uh, now, okay, those parameters are unknown. So it's a much more difficult problem because, okay, if you had only linear weights, you know how to learn, but here you have also to learn <clears throat> the number and the position of, of the knots. And now there's a very nice link with uh, L1 optimization techniques because actually it happens that the total variation two of this uh, neuron here will be the L1 norm of the coefficients that are in front of the radius. And uh, may, maybe uh, let me explain a little. So here is <clears throat> now this equation that specifies the neuron. And, and so you, you see that this will be a linear combination of ReLU. Then I can take the first derivative. Okay, so I differentiate the ReLU, I get like step functions. And so this is like heavy side functions, st still same parameters here. And, uh, and then if I take one more derivative, I end up having a Dirac for at every location of the, of the knot. And now the good thing is that if you compute the second total variation, so it's equivalent of taking this M norm of the, those Dirac's and actually the Dirac's it's in fact set up this way. The Dirac's exactly have a M norm of one. And so this gives us then the L1 norm of, of, of the coefficients. Okay, so this deep spline framework, uh, so it tells us uh, that uh, global optimality is achieved with this uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, spline activation. And it's uh, somehow compatible with existing scheme because just ReLU is the simplest case. We just have one, uh, one, one knot. Uh, linear regression actually is also included because in that case, you don't have any ReLU, you just have the linear term here. <clears throat> and uh, then there are a few variations that have appeared in, in the literature, for example, parametric ReLU, uh, where uh, <clears throat> here you just have uh, one ReLU with a re uh, linear term. And, and so that appeared in 2015. Those people have also showed that if you use those parametric ReLU, it usually improves performance. And there's also uh, uh, some work by uh, Agostinelli et al, where they propose to put maybe a linear combination of ReLUs, but with a fixed number of, of nodes. Uh, uh, so, so it's more uh, complicated activation, but this is empirical. Now we have a, a mathematical justification. Now, maybe uh, let me give you an idea of how we prove that. Uh, and, and this gets us back maybe to interpolation. So let's say if you had those points here, how would you interpolate? So the classical way, that's the spline interpolation way is actually to put the L2 norm on, on, the, sec, on, on the derivative <clears throat> and, and you get this solution. But now the solution that we're using here, we are instead of putting L2 norm, we are putting like more like a L1 norm, but of the second derivative. And uh, now we get this solution here. 
So this is much sparser. See, we have just one knot. It is not necessarily on the data point. So, and this is exactly this total variation to regularization that I, I'm using in, in the theorem. So that will favor solution that have very few knots. And, and somehow then you can kind of put this result, put it inside of the neural network and crank out the result. So, so I'm just not going really through the proof, but you, 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 can, you can just like, let's say by, uh, you can just reframe that as an as a, as a interpolation problem and, 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 and therefore uh, use this, this result that I just presented. <clears throat> now, what are, 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 are the opportunities and the challenges? I guess the opportunities that we can have much more, more sophisticated neurons, we can be adaptive, we can control the complexity with lambda, and we also have the ability to suppress layers. But the problem now, it's, it's you know, how do you determine the number of knots? It's a more difficult optimization problem, and uh, it's, it's difficult actually to find uh, the best trade-off. Uh, uh, now, how, how can we find the best trade-off, uh, maybe having a shallow network with, with more sophisticated activation versus having very deep architectures with very uh, simple uh, ReLU activations. And so now uh, <clears throat> I, I would like to, to end the presentation here uh, by, by uh, uh, <clears throat> actually describing uh, our implementation. And that's uh, really where my PhD soon have helped. <clears throat> because first we had the nice uh, theorem, but we really didn't know how, how to implement. So how to effectively train deep spline uh, activations. <clears throat> so in principle, you, you can say, oh yeah, I, I, I can use stochastic gradient descent like in, in conventional neural networks, but there's really a, one difficulty here is that we have actually to optimize uh, the knot location which is something new here is actually quite difficult. And so there's a workaround. In fact, our workaround is a little inspired also from the work on compressed sensing. We just like put many knots and remember we have a L1 penalty and now we will just uh, uh, use this L1 sparsifying property to we put too many knots and by <clears throat> doing the L1 optimization, it will uh, uh, su suppress the non-necessary ones. And, and so, so here we can do a gridded ReLU representation, so very many knots on the grid, and, and try to solve it like that. But it turns out that this is not very efficient computation. And so there we resort now to uh, spline tricks <clears throat> using a B-spline representation. So instead of uh, representing this as a sum of ReLUs, we prefer to represent it as a sum of triangles, which are B-spline functions plus some boundary functions here. <clears throat> and, 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 and so here, the basis function are essentially triangles. And, and why does this work? <clears throat> uh, actually, it's completely equivalent. And let me show you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, with those triangles, you can express, uh, first of all, the constant. Uh, also the straight line, but you can also express values, okay, by putting triangles. So actually you have the expressive VT, and it also goes the other ways. So you can go from uh, values to B spines because you can express a triangle here as a uh, sum of three shifted values with this weights minus one plus two minus one. <clears throat> And actually, this gives you then also a very simple way of computing the second total variation. It's just the uh, now uh, the L1 norm of, let's say, the differentiation of that, but it will be then those B spline coefficient convolved by those minus one plus two minus one here, which is a second finite difference filter. So you get a very efficient way of implementing this. And, and why, why, it, why is it so good? is because, in fact, we have a complexity that's completely independent of the grid size. And, and, and why that? So you can put as many guys on the grid. And now the miracle here is that if you put yourself at a given location, so it's, if you have one data point, okay, it will just take some value. And actually, for let's say if we're here, we will only have two active 
basis function. So every data point will just hit two basis function. And so that means actually the complexity of computing those B splines is independent of your number of nodes. It, it will always essentially cost two operations, but this also means the other way when you are doing the upgrade of the uh, backpropagation, uh, every point will only affect two uh, basis function. And, and so we, uh, we verified that, 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 that uh, uh, if we were using B splines and putting more or less uh, for, you know, in the deep neural network configuration, putting more or less nodes per activation, uh, nine or, or let's say 500, actually it takes the same memory and it costs exactly the same time to train. Now, if instead we just had put reliefs, so we put nine reliefs, so it, it starts co costing much more, you know, than the B splines. If we put 29, it starts co costing more and more. And if we put, and we couldn't put more than uh, 30 because we exploded the memory, okay? Because you always have to, you know, update everyone, keep everyone in, in memory. So, so it means actually this thing didn't implement. We're not able to implement the thing with values and with B splines, actually it has a complexity that doesn't depend on the finesse of, of your model, which is very nice. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go to the experiment. And so here we did like, uh, just to try to figure out what's going on, a relatively simple experiment here. So we have like two shapes here. And, and uh, if we are inside one region here, you, you are in uh, one class and otherwise the another class. And, 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 and so essentially you want to learn this indicator function. And uh, so there, uh, what we uh, uh, sort of, uh, we use, I mean, this is, is uh, you know, a two dimensional relatively simple problem. So we use the more or less complicated architecture. So a very simple architecture, they call that simple net. And then we put uh, uh, much wider here, 120 uh, 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 neurons and also more or less depth. And so here's if we use ReLU and uh, here is the error rate. <clears throat> and uh, so with ReLU uh, and this simple thing, it doesn't work well, but if we make the thing much uh, wider, uh, we, we can really decrease the error. Now, pre-ReLU works better because it has a few more parameters, a PL here and, and the B splines. I mean, the B splines here uh, outperform everyone. And what's amazing, even with this very, very simple neural network, uh, they, ca they, 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 they can essentially obtain the best performance. So very shallow, very simple network. <clears throat> and, and so maybe here is another, another illustration. So if we just have this very simple network, if we just do values, I mean, we have very little expressivity. So not really able to do much, but if we use uh, our, our splines here, uh, even very few uh, uh, splines, uh, uh, I mean, we, we can do almost perfect here. And, and of course, now the other approaches, if you put, uh, you, you know, more neurons, I mean, it, it starts being better. If you put also more layers, it, 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 it starts being better. But I, I would say with the splines, uh, uh, we have the complexity in the nonlinearity, but then we, we can use very few layers. <clears throat> now we, uh, with the same experiment, we can also uh, 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 look a little at the effect of the regularization. And uh, uh, remember there was a lambda that was acting <clears throat> on, on the total variation. So if we impose more or less total variation, and, and then here we, we're just counting the number of surviving uh, uh, <clears throat> knots, uh, uh, you, you know, in, in our final architecture. And as, as you blow up uh, lambda, you have, you know, uh, less knots that, that survive. <clears throat> and, and at the end, uh, actually, you just have a linear classifier. But uh, what, what you can see here, you have a kind of plateau and, and uh, and, and, and so it, it, here it is, it, is, it is good, for example, to have this operating point here where we have a very uh, a low error here <coughs> with, with a relatively uh, small number of, of, of spline coefficients because we, we want also to have a, a simple model. 
Now we also do the, uh, you, you know, more conventional uh, classification experiments. So that's the famous uh, CIFAR data set. And, and so that's uh, really like classifying images. So you have a, a, a small version, a larger version. <clears throat> so using a kind of standard network in network architecture. So uh, here we're able <clears throat> to improve <clears throat> somewhat uh, uh, <clears throat> on, the, on the ReLU architecture and certainly on the uh, APLU. So that was like fixed number of, 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 uh, uh, of nodes per, 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 per uh, activation. And, and so that's using a relatively old architecture. If we use ResNet, I mean, with ResNet, everyone improves. Uh, and, uh, but we're still like ahead of, of the others by, by some margin. And you know, this kind of improvement for neural network is, is, is significant. And, and if we do a CIFAR uh, 100, it, it's more or less also consistent results. And then what we looked at is uh, at an inverse problem, okay? Because at the end, uh, we want to apply that to, to do <clears throat> image reconstruction. And so we are kind of here setting up a linear inverse problem uh, here uh, in, in 1D. So we, we, we have like, uh, <clears throat> uh, and, and here we have a, a signal that has a sparse innovation so that the derivative would be sparse. So it's kind of piecewise uh, <clears throat> constant uh, signals. And, and so here we use uh, relatively simple unrolled architectures with uh, linear layers. And, and, and so here we looked at various uh, configurations, either having ReLU <clears throat> alone, so that gives us this, this kind of uh, signal to noise ratio. Actually, this is, has to be compared with total variation. In fact, for this problem, total variation well, is, is kind of, yeah, you know, ideally <clears throat> suited. And, and so here you see that, I mean, a ReLU network will outperform total variation <clears throat> and uh, now, uh, what, 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 what we can do, um, uh, we, we, we can now learn uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, those activation. And, and so here we can either share, maybe to reduce the number of parameters, and we can share them globally. Everyone uses the same but learned activation, or every channel. Uh, 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 shares the same activation or every la layer uh, shares uh, the same activation and unshared. And so you see here that, uh, I, I, mean, I mean, learning improves. And if you, if you, if you don't share, you're, 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 you're better, but you end up having more parameters. And this, of course, uh, uh, will outperform compressed sensing. Now, the last thing we looked at uh, is the effect of depth. And, and, and so we can put more or less layers. And, and now what, what we found is, uh, for example, just with ReLU, if we put more and more layers, in fact, we kind of reach an optimum and, and then no, nothing happens anymore. And, and uh, now the thing is when we look, uh, use also more layers with, with uh, our deep splines, we, we kind of get uh, also to the same optimum. But uh, I think what, what is important here is that we, we, we can do better than ReLU if we have less layers, and, and that's significant. Okay, so that gets me to the conclusion that I like to call the return of the spline. Uh, <clears throat> so splines and machine learning, so that deep neural networks are in fact high dimensional piecewise linear splines, and so that's also like uh, some artistic illustration so that actually uh, continuous piecewise linear function have, can express anything. So for example, those statues here that are <clears throat> piecewise, continuous piecewise linear. And now you can have <clears throat> free form activation, which gives you uh, deep splines. And uh, now we presented a practical implementation method using uh, B-spline activation modules. And, and so we, I, the main message now we have an algorithm that is fast and easy to train and that's scalable in time and memory thanks to the B-spline is competitive with uh, other trainable architectures. And uh, I think the, the, the interesting part here is that it will allow for shallower and more robust uh, networks because it is also known that 
I mean, those deep neural networks have a, have a problem. They're not very stable. That comes from uh, the fact that you are having lots of layers. And so I'd like to, to thank everyone, uh, now the, the co-authors here and the uh, other people in my team who are uh, saying hello to you. And, and uh, <clears throat> uh, last, uh, oops, okay, last here, uh, the, some references. Uh, I think here the math uh, paper here on, 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 on the foundation, the, 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 the uh, representer theorem, and here uh, a paper that just ap uh, appeared here uh, on, on this practical algorithm that I just described. And for those who are interested in application of deep neural networks in imaging that I discussed at the beginning, there are also those uh, papers here. And I'd like to thank you all. And uh, I'm open to questions.